Hey y'all. Hey everybody. It's Marissa Alexander. Here we are again on Wednesday and I hope that you all are doing okay as best as you can. I want to thank everybody for sharing my videos and joining me. I appreciate that. I think it's just good to have conversation about these things. I think out loud. I can tell you a lot of my conversation is about a lot of the things that's going on right now. Um, because it's such a huge impact on, you know, the world, the society, but I know that it's quite possible, obviously my community, but it's quite possible that it, at some point, which, you know, God forbid, it can affect somebody close to me and family. So it's huge, um, for me to be able to be able to do this, but also connect with it's you about all. a lot of the things that's going on right now. Yeah, see how that works? <laughs> and so, um, I just wanted to, um, give you a couple of seconds of to join and um, let's talk about it. But in the meantime, while everybody is joining, I do want to know how you're doing and I want to know how you feel. I hope you are taking care of yourself. I'm trying to. I think I posted about just taking a step back. It can be extremely overwhelming. And um, there's this thing called vicarious trauma. And so it's almost the idea is that you feel someone else's trauma. So it's like you live that trauma vicariously through watching other things and other people grieve and other people mourn and, and then their de des uh, desperation and then their pain. So there's this vicarious feeling, it's empathy, but it's almost like we relive the trauma if we've experienced it or we kind of go through it. So be mindful of that and make sure you're taking care of yourself and um, loving on one another, checking on your friends, checking on your friends that's lost. Um, loved ones to this type of violence or any type of violence or right? it's just anybody that's gone people don't forget their loved ones once they're gone so make sure you check on them um so i'm not sure who's on here but i'm gonna see if i got the comments going hey andre hey isaac how y'all doing today so i wanted to talk about um camera footage and and specifically recording videos from civilians or people who are bystanders versus the body cams from the officers and let me tell you how I got to that I was doing some research on the officers that I know that they're protesting in the town of Jacksonville Florida and I noticed that there was a panel last week with our mayor our sheriff and our state attorney and I was listening to some of the things that they were saying, and I also read their memorandum. And what I, what stuck out to me was that it, I got the impression that, you know, they are having some challenges implementing the body cams, or maybe it's just a, a process of how to make sure they roll them out, and then what's the procedure for viewing the information. But honestly, it sounded like a lot of spin doctoring to me. Um, I do know that they, had an officer um, who had some video footage of him and prior to him having that video footage and it was during the time that they had body cams he had had he had several complaints against him it wasn't until somehow he was captured record he was recorded uh, beating up a teenager it was an officer and it was recorded on video um, hey Pauline and once the video made it to the sheriff's office is only then when they made the decision to arrest him and file charges. And so that got me to thinking about a lot of the things that they were saying, because they did say that they, Melissa did mention that she has um, prosecuted some officers and that they are under investigation. Um, what I thought was interesting was that they have a team of people that rotate a month that are specifically designed to look at uh, cases where there's an officer shooting. What I didn't understand from that process was how long does it, if you collect the evidence and you're only in rotation for a month, then when do you turn it over? Are you expected to complete the investigation of the, the officer shooting in a month? And so with, if the month runs out and everything is, the investigation is not complete, then does somebody have to re you know, start the investigation once they're in rotation? Do they have to turn over where they are? And what made me question that is because that's the delay and how long it takes to get body cam footage. Because in our state, 
um, they, the body cam uh, footage cannot be released until the investigation is complete. So if it's set up like that, that means that it would just be an ongoing, ongoing investigation and it won't get released. And so that's one issue and something obviously that I believe that is a problem just from the outside looking in. I'm quite sure somebody internally has recognized that that's a procedure or a step that needs to be revised. And I can't determine whether or not it's by design or not. I'm not going to speculate. So, hey, James. Hey, Dina. Dina and Sinclair. Hey, how y'all doing? So that's what made me think about body camera footage versus um, public or civilian recording and how important it has been over the last uh, few years um, that we've been able to make such huge, you know, discovery because people have been actually recording these things where um, technology has advanced and, you know, certain people and officers were not uh, doing what they should have been doing and they were being recorded. And so that footage has come to light, obviously gone viral, and then, you know, here we are and so on and so forth. So that's what we're going to be talking about today because I know that I'm at the point now where I am just about ready to record anybody I see being pulled over where it's multiple police officers. I'm almost at that point, specifically people of color, more black women and men and, and young people, because I, I'm really concerned that um, that is almost very much needed. And I think we might want to talk about that. So we're going to talk about that today. Will Donald, he said it's crazy because they charge civilians quicker depending on upon the status of the person. Um, they really need need an outside source. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think that I, I struggle with when obviously officers have a job. And so there's, you know, all types of things that I guess we or me as a civilian who isn't in law enforcement. I have no tactical training. I, I don't have a military background, um, would not know. But in my experience with my case, I felt like there was an expectation that I turned into a B-16, um, B-16 agent. B-16, 13 agent, I think it's B-16, and this is from, you know, scandal, but I, to me there was this, it was almost like there was an expectation for me to do things outside of what a normal per person would do, but what I've been, ever, you know, observing is that there's so much, um, you know, emphasis on the officer feeling that, you know, their life with reasonable fear is a, a consideration that be, would be different than a civilian meaning that somehow they're superhuman or better yet the life of them is a little higher of a priority and you know human nature is human nature so i thought that was very interesting um so i think that recently even with mr brooks case as of today i believe they filed additional charges and i want to say that initially you know how you get little clips of the videos? Well, that was coming from like, like um, I think parking lot footage and maybe some other surveillance in the area. And then at some point we started to see the officer body cam footage released, which is from what I understand is, is unprecedented because um, before it take, took a while. So what we're seeing with Atlanta is something really new, meaning how quickly they're turning over the body cam um, footage from the officer and so when I first seen it I was like I don't know you know and, and let me be clear I don't believe anybody he didn't have to die I don't care what was done um I don't you know understand at first I was like you pull over for do you you die you know what I mean and you I mean how many of us actually know people that have been pulled over for a DUI, went to jail for a DUI, and you couldn't imagine or, or fathom it escalating as quickly as it did. But as the footage was being released, it was being released, and you know, I kind of was like, oh, this is not a good look. This is what I was thinking. I was like, this is not a good look. And, and I hesitated to make, um, um, uh, make a conclusion about what I felt. I will tell you, I was thinking to myself, well, if he was running away, was that his that to me the officer used his gun at that point because he's to stop him from getting away and i 
did not think that was right. And so as we are now seeing, there was there were several um, SOP, which is a standard operating procedures that he did not complete or that he did not do properly. So now that's also in question. So that was just with the body cam footage. And that was also with the footage from the, um, the outside surveillance, right? So that was to me initially, I was like, well, why did he start? You know, I figured he panicked and, and there was a scuffle and I'm like, you know, two of them couldn't get a, you know, a guy who was intoxicated. It would just look, you know, it was just really hard to kind of, you know, get to why it escalated that quickly and then what everybody was feeling at that time. And then you do this thing where you're like, let me put myself in their shoes, which is very hard to do. I still didn't understand why if he was running away, I always say you can't outrun radio, um, why they could not, you know, go about it a different way. But I'm assuming more details will come out. So then today we see where there's actual videos, but they took, you know, still shots of it where the officer kicked the um, Mr. Brooks after he shot him and he was on the ground. Um, he was no longer posing a threat and also stood on his, um, his body and his arms. And see, that's where civilian um, video, video footage and, and camera recording is very, very important because that is an angle that the body cam or the other surveillance footage did not get. So I think that's something to consider. And I'd like to know, you know, how you all feel about that based on your experience, based on the things that you've seen. So I guess my point being is at first I was kind of like, oh, this is going to be a difficult, you know, conversation in terms of I don't care. He shouldn't have, he shouldn't have, you know, lost his life for that. Like he shouldn't have, you know, been killed. But I was trying to understand how they were going to relay this information to the public. How were they going to report it? What was going to be said? And I thought to myself, this is going to be one of those cases where they're going to say, see, you know, see, this is that, or this is the reason why this has happened. So that did happen. I'm pretty sure you all have been seeing a lot of people post about it. I've even seen retired officers and, and current law enforcement talk about, you know, what would have been done. The question would, uh, about the procedure and what they would have done if that was in fact their, you know, that was their um, incident that they experienced. And so I guess you just don't know really until you actually experience it. But that's one of the things that was important for me to kind of bring out to you today. It just appears that the, the public can be in such a rock and a hard place. And what I mean by that is, you know, we've advocated or they, you know, being they, the law enforcement to be transparent and to wear body cams. And, you know, some of them do it the right way and some of them don't. You know, we've seen instances where they've turned off their body cams and uh, or they were malfunctioning right at the, the time of an incident. But we we're also seeing where people are saying, because I don't have trust of law enforcement because they are killing us and getting off because people are dying because people feel like they're being targeted that we're going to also stand here and make sure we capture what's going on as well and we've seen incidents where if you don't know your rights and you don't know the, the laws then you know sometimes officers become defensive about being recorded and I'm going to put a link in this video for you all to you know access at your leisure where it talks about um, rules for engaging and recording an incident that you happen to be around if it's a police involved you know incident obviously police involved but if you're there and you're not interfering what is the best way to go about doing that and without causing an issue with the officer or inter interfering on down to the worst case scenario you might be arrested even if it's bogus but just to make sure that you know your rights and how far to stand back um, what to say if in fact you are um, engaged by an officer during an incident where you are recording so i'll put that in my link
Thank you, Pauline. She says it's a great conversation. I really think it is. And I think it's a great conversation because you, this is the times we're in and there's a lot going on. Confederate monuments and all kinds of things are coming down and names of, you know, uh, bridges and other roads and schools and things are being considered. And I mean, I guess I understand the, the intent. But I don't think black people ever said, hey, I'm going to need you in the midst of stop killing us. By the way, change those names of of those Confederate monuments behind these federal, you know, Confederate uh, soldiers or generals or whatnot. Um, for the most part, we don't know their name unless we you know, run up on it to see that's their name. And we look it up and say, oh, that's what they did. And I'm going to be quite honest with you. I don't think white people know who they are either, especially the, um, the, the, the more, you know, younger generation. I don't think they know who they are. And, you know, the statues represent the, the, the racism and what the Confederacy stood for, their treason, um, their, their fight to keep slavery. And we know that. But as of right now, our issues aren't with statues. And it, it's great you're taking them down, but I definitely think you need to go a whole lot further than that. And I'm seeing, hey, um, Tangie, and I'm seeing also that they're changing the Aunt Jemima. Who asked for that? <laughs> Who asked for that? And then Uncle Ben, they're, they're, yeah, they're evolving. To what? Anyway, let me know the persons or the group of the black community that spoke up on the behalf of making this request, because I'm, I'm quite confused by that. And I believe that this week the the president that the president um, signed an executive order, and I'll let you go out there and look it up for yourself. I think we need to really be mindful of the verbiage and the intent of it. Um, didn't seem like we moved any needle on the banning of the chokehold. As a matter of fact, we're right back to square one. It's still up to discretion. It's still up to the person's subjective opinion, and I just don't think that moves the needle, as well as um, incentivizing the uh, the law enforcement officers for or the police departments for putting quote unquote problematic officers in a database, and incentivizing meaning funding, and the word funding was used, and if we are having conversations about reform or defunding, then you don't add more funding. And so these are things we might want to make sure that we look into to make sure we understand what that's being said and also know what people are advocating for and your communities. And I know there's still protests going on. I pray that you all continue to do those for as long as you can. That's not easy and that you are taking care of one another while you're on the front line because we see that protesters are coming up missing and um, things of that nature, but also goes back to the topic, which is recording. And I think for here in Jacksonville, I think it was a few drones that caught some activity of police doing things they were not doing, that supposed to be doing, which helped uh, protesters that were arrested to be able to get off, to be able to have that additional footage. So that's another point. If you, um, in your community, got a couple of, you know, a couple of hundred dollars, then pull your money together and also get into drone drone flying that is an, an emerging technology that can be cross referenced to other jobs so just consider that but as we move forward and we need to have all eyes on deck not just the agencies it's self transparency through their body camera um, camera footage but also from us being able to record and police the police because that's just where we are right now hey Nicole hey D Demetria I remember D hey sweetie the company said it was time for a change. That's what they said. Okay. All right. Well, we'd like more changes. Um, their donations of money would be fine. Who did they say they're going to name or two? And I don't know if that's a pressing issue, but it definitely has been past time for a change. And I'll say this. Who, who's on these boards and these committees coming up with all these recommendations? It cannot be anybody that's connected to the real work and the real understanding of the issues that we are asking for um, as a, a black community, because I'd like to know who was the person that was like, Hey, I think we need to change Aunt Jemima. Cause that could be terribly offensive to people. 
I don't know. Tell me if that's something you might see. Who knows? I see a few of you all are saying that some of your companies are letting um, Juneteenth be an actual day off, even a half a day. Okay. We'll see how that goes. Let me know your thoughts on that. The other thing I want to talk about is the different angles and the different angles of the recording and the camera footage and how those make a difference and how the evidence is then collected and then how they determine what actions they're going to take moving forward in terms of whether they're going to arrest or charge or an officer. Some of them, they put them on what is it, administrative leave, which they still collect them a paycheck, which I have a problem with. And I think that if you do some looking into your own town, I think you will see that the officers that have um, an extensive history of excessive force or um, misconduct or also involved in like police, you know, um, officer shooting incidents, they have a past of that. And what concerns me is that leadership, you know, like the sheriff and other, um, you know, um, leaders within the department know who they are and they, you know, have a code, if you will speak to that. Um, I think it's not an uncommon knowledge. I think everybody understands that that exists. And my concern is it's an issue of public safety because they are still out there patrolling communities, specifically communities that they have a extensive record with these type of incidents. And then we have to wait until somebody civilian uh, records a incident where they've gone too far once again. But the difference is it's, un it's indisputable because we've recorded it on a camera. And I just think that's negligent. And I'm going to be honest with you, piss poor, because when you're in leadership, you're expected to be preventative, um, proactive and be accountable. And when you see issues like this in your department, regardless of the, these, this, this thing that we have going on in terms of, or they have going on, which is the blue wall of silence and all of that, I just think it's really unfair because then that is contradictory to protecting and serving the community. So I have an issue with that. And I know we're seeing a lot of that and it will continue to show itself and render itself. And the sad part is I don't believe that people should have to die um, for them to make a change with that. So I'm going to try to get off that soapbox for a minute. Keith Black. Eye for an eye, it's the white community protecting face. That's why they want to change the syrup's name. Well, that went from here to syrup. <laughs> I hear you, Keith. Um, you know, at this point, the, uh, the idea is that there's changes that obviously need to take place. And it doesn't start with... The, the name changing is not even really a key component and it's just not even a tip of the iceberg to me. We're talking about infrastructural changes, um, infrastructure changes. We're talking about systemic changes. We're talking about institutional changes because that is the governing body. That is the politic that's taking place. I had a, a friend of mine mention how deeply political um, the police and law enforcement and the government are intertwined together, which is why it's so difficult to make such a change and move forward on things like that. And I think that's something we, that we have to consider when we start thinking about um, funding and um, who we want to vote and elect and what we want in our communities. And in some of the, the more, uh, the less, uh, the, the, uh, the communities where people are uh, really struggling and they have not a lot of funding even the, they are heavily policed they are heavily policed and also they the stores around them the, the business around them the owners of those businesses for the most part don't look like them they start they have different um you know indian or you know um a, you know asian owners and so there's a you know there's a disconnect on on that level as well and i just think that's something that we need to be mind uh, mindful of when we're considering developments in who we want to put in as our state representatives and our councilmen uh, and councilwomen or aldermen depending on which region you're in in our own city and that's you know that's helpful that's just one of the pieces i think one of my i think what is her name let me find pauline said to fill out the 2020 census and make sure you register to vote 
I, I did fill out my 2020 cens, um, census, and I think that is important. I think there were some people who had some issues, not to jump off topic, but there were a few people that had issues with filling it out, um, didn't trust it, um, felt like it was a tool the government was using to just, you know, basically get more information to use against you. And I actually filled it out, and I can tell you, like I put on another post, that you don't put anything on that census. That, in other words, the census does, doesn't get too detailed into what's going on in your home. And I can assure you, you have more stuff on Facebook that people can look up and find out about your 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 um, your household and your living than you put on the census. So just consider that that is how the um, the government and how money is allotted to your community. So it's advantageous for you to make sure that you fill them out. And then I will say if you drive into other areas that are more affluent and so on and so forth, they do fill out their census. They do make sure that they hold their council, you know, council people um, accountable. But for the most part, they kind of don't have to, they're not rocking the boat too much because there's not too much going on, but we have a lot going on in our communities. So we need to make sure that we take that, the, the whole approach as we work through stuff. And then the, the last thing I want to talk about before we go is the, I've heard a couple of people put this, which is huge to me. If you're in an incident and there's people around you who you don't know, and I've heard people say, hey, don't, don't stand there and record me, you know, jump in and do something or intervene. And I want to bring this point up because I'd like to know what you all think about it. You know, I had a conversation with somebody about it, and I think that we definitely want to to be mindful of the pros and cons of that. Now, in the case of Mr. Floyd, if somebody would have intervened, I don't know what that would have looked like, but I could imagine, based on the the four officers and the disposition of the officer Chauvin, then it would have more than likely got pretty bad, and then the if other people would have been hurt for intervening or um you know trying to 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 save mr floyd's life then somebody else could have got hurt um, we don't know what that footage would have looked like and also it would have been uh, you know a, a super a mess and they would have made it seem like it was just this mob and the police had you know i don't know shoot a bunch of people to you know get things under control and so I don't know that that's the direction we want to go. So let's, you know, let me know what you think about that. Uh, Nicole uh, Shree Young says, your daughter just turned 18. Um, she wants to do um, peaceful protesting. You said you're terrified. Uh, you said your niece had a smoke grenade thrown at her in DC. Um, she has a huge burn on her back and your daughter is very passionate. Uh, about not just black rights, but human rights. Absolutely. See, that's the whole thing. This you, black rights wouldn't be an issue if we had human rights equal across everybody, because then we wouldn't have to distinguish between black rights and uh, LBGTQ uh, rights and so on and so forth. So if you just establish that human rights, regardless of your sex, your orientation, your race, your age, human, then we wouldn't need to establish that it's a black right or black lives matter. And I think by this time people either know or don't know. And anybody that's looking to, to argue about that is really wasting your time. And I would say, take that energy that you would um, not use argue, or you would use arguing with them and put it into something more effective and um, um, attainable and something that you can see and support because having those arguments are futile. But um, I hear you. I hear you, I'm sure, um, Nicole. If your daughter's in town and you are somewhere close, maybe go with her. I know my daughter's quite passionate about those things as well as I am. I would like to say that I wouldn't want her to go out there by herself. Um, if she went with a group of you know, friends, I'd like to have a conversation with them about how to look out for one another, not to get separated. I think those are things we need to have a conversation about as well and or go with her. That's what I would, um, that's what I would say. But, um, you know, I appreciate you guys joining me for today. I just want to leave you with understanding, um, listening to people when they have these town halls and these panels, listen to what they're saying, but be very, very mindful of what they're not saying. 
if they're dodging questions, if they are um, saying that they in fact are doing things, make sure they can back it up. It's public record. Um, you pay the salary, you're a taxpayer, they are accountable to you. Um, the other thing is to make sure you know your rights as you are recording. If you are someone who's going to record incidents, whether it involves um, you know, a shooting or not, if you see somebody pulled over, you see a friend, um, or whatever the case may be, you are with a friend and something takes place, uh, make sure you know the rules of that. I'll be posting, you know, actually an article in there that will give you some insight on the best way to go about that. Also to be mindful that it's easy to jump to conclusions, but now we're seeing that, you know, with the transparency of at least Atlanta Police Department releasing video cam, um, camera footage. Um, but I would say this about, you know, taking the time to release camera footage from a body cam of an officer. Consider this, if it was in fact something that would absolve them of any wrongdoing and, and qualify them as justified, I don't think that it would hesitate to release it. So oftentimes when they're holding on to it, it just seems like it's like you have something to hide. So, you know, I think we need to continue to be um, advocating for that transparency as well, as well as changing those laws. If in fact your state has it like Florida, which is an extra layer, which is the um, Office of Bill of Rights. And then um, also making sure that we are um, mindful of our positions where we, when there's different incidents and angles and different cameras and waiting for that all to come out. And then the last thing would be if you are recording and, and, and have a conversation with your people about intervening, I, I just wouldn't want anybody else to be hurt or harmed from jumping into a situation I have mixed opinions about this from different people. They don't want to be recorded. They want to be helped. And that can go bad and, you know, and left real quick. So we definitely want to make sure that um, we are having conversations about what that looks like. And um, because I know we sat there and watched the bystanders really be upset about, you know, asking the, office, the officers to not, you know, to get off of the head, you can ease up. And they didn't. And that was eight minutes and 46 seconds, and that's tough. But there's also been other situations where it could go bad quickly if other people intervene um, and other people can get hurt. And it just, and it could be a mob situation. So I would say use some discernment um, about that. So let's see. Okay, you said ask, and this is Joanna Petitioner. Ask question. Ask the questions out loud. Questions are often more threatening to people who have things to hide. Absolutely. So um, you at, you can say, well, what are you doing? Again, this is, I mean, there's a lot of this about knowing your rights, and and you 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 need to know that once you start going down that path, depending on their the officer's uh, disposition or how they feel about what's going on at that point, especially being recorded, you might be met with some resistance on down to um, arrest. But, you know, these are things that we're going to have to decide if we're willing to, um, you know, go the distance with that. And I'm not going to sit up and tell you that I've thought that all the way through. I have thought that I will stop and record every, you know, incident if I can and can do it. I've really been thinking hard about that, especially if those, there's nobody else around. But um, intervening to a point where it can get myself harmed and, um, you know, I actually get another additional charge. Not trying to go back to jail. So that's just something you guys are going to have to think about. But just some information passed along. I'll put these links in here once the video is done. Um, and that's all I got. Thank you for letting me get 34 minutes of your time today. And you all keep, you know, looking out for one another. Um, definitely keep taking care of one another. Take a step back, breathe, and then just come back up for air. Peace out.